Hi, everyone. Thanks for coming today. Um, first, I want to thank my panel and introduce my panel today. We're going to start with Lily, who's at the end over there. And she is the co-founder of the Bombay Beach Biennial, which just had its first or second iteration last weekend, Easter weekend, out in the Salton Sea, which was amazing. Um, Tal Nguyen, who is an art agent and cultural strategist at CAA. And also, um, she also curates CAA's art collection and is involved with MOCA and Desert X, which is something Lily is also involved with, Desert X this year. Uh, Jamie Manet is a Los Angeles native and she's the deputy director of the Marciano Art Foundation. Sorry, I'm reading. I won't be doing this the whole time. I just want to make sure to get your titles correct. What's that? <laughs> uh, Sonia Roth is the managing director of Christie's Western US region, which just opened its beautiful new showroom in Beverly Hills. You should definitely check out. And Sarah Watson is the director of Spruth Magers Gallery in Los Angeles and has also previously worked at LM in Venice and Gagosian in Beverly Hills, and even Deitch before that. And so, Paula. And Paula Cooper? Wow. We have two Paula Cooper alums here. I didn't know that part. Um, so today's conversation is going to be about kind of, actually, first a question for the audience. How many people here have collected art or have bought art for their homes? Show of hands. OK, so we have a decent number of collectors in the room. So the first part of our conversation is going to be a, kind of about what is a good collector, what is collecting mean now, and then we're gonna start looking at some trends for the art market in terms of people's relationships with artists um, and how that's perhaps changing or not changing, and then future going forward, what's collecting 20, 30 years from now, a little predictive work also. So we have some, in, some ex we have experts in all different areas here who can talk about individual and corporate collection and all different ways to approach a collecting. So I'm going to start really simple. I'm going to start with Sarah and Sonia, who both have had a lot of experience working with individuals about what is a good collector. A good collector. I want to buy a lot of art. <laughs> 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 um, well, you know, I mean, it also depends in terms of what level, you know, I mean, because you know, there are people who are just starting out and how is that a good collector and then somebody who's sort of like, you know, sort of mid-career and then they're looking for more blue chip items. So I think they're kind of come at every level. For me personally, um, I mean, I think there have to be two things involved um, for it to be a good collector. I mean, but although I'm not tr truly kidding about somebody's a good collector that they buy instead of art, I'm, just, I'm a dealer because it's my criteria. But um, I do think that I, it requires, first of all, um, no matter what, you have to love it. I mean, and I think that that's sort of where something starts. You know, I mean, there are a lot of things when you start when you start buying art. You know, I mean, there are things that I bought that I don't. I, it, it's not. The thread, to, you know, through my collection, which isn't that, but I mean, it, it, you know, you don't have that starting out. So, but you, if you love something, it's meaningful, and you will never regret buying something. If, and then, but then also, you have to sort of think about it from, um, you know, from a financial standpoint. Does this make sense? Do I have the money to do this? I mean, I think the more money you spend, the more research you have to do in terms of how it fits market-wise. Um, and, you know, I mean, if you spend, you know, if you're just starting out and you spend $10,000 and, you know, it doesn't work out, but you love it, you know, but it's only $10,000, that's fine, you know, but you don't really make a sort of an impulse buy. You'd be like, I love it. And, and I mean, you can if you have that, those kinds of resources. But I think, I think it, it has to be a really good combination of the two. But I, I really do hope that at the end of the day, then the collectors that I respond to are ones that are sort of more artist and content driven rather than something more mercurial or so they have a strategy of some kind ish yeah i mean some <laughs> part of it shouldn't be it shouldn't yeah. be just it's kind of like impulse so that's what so did you have a, a take on I that i certainly agree with sarah on a lot of points um i think a good collector is really somebody who has a real love and passion for the art that they're collecting, whatever that is, whether they're photography collectors, painting collectors, or cross category. 
but it's the, the real desire to learn about what you're buying, to understand it and how it speaks to you, you know, and, and that's the context that's gonna make that thread in your collection consistent. It is. So if you keep it personal, then that thread will become evident because you're the, you're the thread yeah. <laughs> or your personality is the exactly. thread. And I think what Sarah was pointing to, which is very true these days, is that since the prices of art have gone up so much, you know, even in the last decade, I mean, I remember when I started collecting, you could buy something great for a couple thousand dollars, like this is great. Um, and that's just not the case anymore. And so when you start talking about larger numbers, you know, you really do have to think a little bit about uh, value going forward, which is more difficult to remain true to what your passions are and what you really like because you can never really tell. But the problem is, is that when you hit a certain price mark, you know, the reality of every collector is that your taste will change. So where you start out, and the things that you love, as you grow, your collection's gonna grow. And the, and the idea and the thread that holds your collection grows. And so sometimes you may wanna look at a piece that you bought 10 years ago that you've, I don't wanna say outgrown, but in a way you've moved on from. And if it doesn't have the holding value, then you, you can't turn it over into something else. You know? And at the, the price points we're talking about these days, um, most collectors you know, do have to, not all of them, God bless them, but some of them have to sell to buy. You know? As a gallerist, how do you feel about that, Sarah? Like people having for a couple I, of years? Is there a period of time? I, 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 frankly, I, I mean, I, I, I'm not, I don't think this is sort of usual in my case. I, I think there's no, nothing wrong with wanting to resell. I think you just have to be, um, have some integrity when you do it. You know, I mean, people chase, uh, you know, change. That's normal. Um, and I just think, you know, I mean, there's some things that people are going to hold on to, and a lot of galleries, are, ourselves included, you know, when we, on our invoices, we put, you know, you need to hold on to this for a certain amount of years, and if you sell it, it gets, you know, first right of refusal. Most of these things are not enforceable. Um, as some, unless you have, like, 15-page contracts, they can be. But, you know, it's more a, it's, yeah, I mean, it's, it's you know, and honestly, like, I think, I, I think it's unreasonable to think that, that, especially if they're young and they're sort of buying at a smaller price point, I mean, people who... You know, there are people who bought work for five thousand dollars. You know that this happens now, and then in two years they become two hundred thousand dollars. And for some people, like that's a lot of money. And why shouldn't they, you know, sort of, uh, you know, why shouldn't they be able to, you know, cash in on that in a certain way? Because most of them want to put it into something else. And if you go back to the person who bought it to you for, uh, buy, you know, bought it uh, that you sold it for to you and. I, I think that there's there's really nothing wrong with that. I just think that there has to be a certain transparency and um, a relationship between a collector and a dealer to make it work. I promise we're not going to stay too long on this, but I'm just wondering what does integrity look like in that situation? Because it might. I don't know. I don't. I don't. <laughs> I wish I saw it more often. But I, I, you know, I. I think it's keeping the artist in mind. Yeah. I mean, and that's, their career. Yeah. Well, I, mean, I mean, and the dealers. I mean, you know, we. It's it's not a museum. I mean, we we sell art to stay in business. That that is. It's not it's not a kunstala. It's not a foundation. I mean, that is our business. That's how we feed the artists. We represent living people, and you know the money goes back to them, and and that's how we. Keep but a gallery also the, manages their career. So, yeah. You know, it, it's also kind of a, where things go and where they're placed. Um. You know, and then uh, and then a, a work of art can go to auction and it goes through the roof and that can you know as much as that seems sort of antithetical I mean like it, that can actually be harmful for an artist's career um, because then everybody throws things at auction and then you know and then their market you know it, it becomes really tricky so I think it's really sort of keeping within in the family is really sort of I think the best so communication of some kind yes. Okay. <laughs> yes. notification even yeah a heads up a heads up uh, yeah so like a good collector I guess is somebody who obviously buys from the heart and like Now, when you've put your collection together, Sonia, have you had a strategy or what? Actually, when we started, not at all. It was so organic in LA. Like, LA was a different place, you know, 15 years ago. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, and there were just a lot of artists who were coming out of art school and working. And um, we were so young at the time. We just, and we had nothing else to do. So Josh and I, were, my husband and I were together, and we didn't go out. And so we just hung out with the artists and our galleries. And, anybody who was involved in the arts, and that was our community. 
And so we bought a lot from really young guys, but also from friends, you know, to other people's friends. And so that's, like I said, the personal aspect of it is a labor of love and um, support for the community. And, you know, that's really how it started out, you know, without really, more, and again, these things were not expensive, you know, um, I mean, they made money, but they weren't, you know, you know we're talking about now, and it's just like something that we can really love to live with and be with, you know. It's the best strategy. Well, for the least that yeah. <laughs> it was good. And has it, has, has it evolved since then, or? It has. I mean, like I said, the prices have gone up so much, and, um, you know, it's, it's different now because there's so many artists and so many guys, like young guys. Like back then there weren't that many. There were maybe like three or four. Um, and then they were the mid level and then that kind of goes with the higher level galleries. But um, there are so many artists who are working and there's just a flood of, uh, of information, if that you will. You know, I see so much stuff, it's harder and harder for me to filter. And also, a great collector told me when we started out, you know, by your generation, because that's what you're going to understand. Like, you're going to really feel an artist who's your age and going through what you're going through and understand that process more than somebody who's, you know, a generation above you or below you. And so I guess as I get older, you know, things that I can identify with and really understand, you know, stick with my generation. And so that's where my collection has been as well, you know, it's just more you know. That it's makes just, a lot of sense. No, that's also, I would say, like, that's also the people that, I mean, not, not to... Yeah, to say that, I mean, you, you can afford your generation too. Like, I mean, like, it, I, I, I would, I named my son Cy after Cy Twombly, and that I would love to have, you know, a Cy Twombly. And I think it still speaks to me. I mean, there's certain things, but you know, when you, you know, you gotta have goals. But um, <laughs> but I think that um, but I think that that's a, that's a really really good point. So you do you buy young women or young people because that's also what you do for. Yeah. But also, it's also where you're understanding them. Yeah, you know, for you know, sure. And then you you will grow with it, and hopefully, you know, everything. And then I had this kind of the same question for Jamie about how from the kind of corporate or the, the perhaps we'll start with you, Jamie, how the Marciano family did their collection history start? Um, so the Marciano, I work for Maurice Marciano and Paul Marciano, and they began collecting in the 80s. Um, they collected uh, modern and contemporary, so Richter, Morris Lewis, Ed Ruscha, um Judd, um, Kenneth Noland, um, and they amassed a very amazing collection. Um, unfortunately, they uh, deassessed a lot of it in the early 90s, um, and then they took a break from collecting for about 15 years. Um, and then in 2007, they started collecting again, uh, all contemporary. So they really dove in, and for the last, you know, <laughs> for the last um, eight years I've been with them, We've amassed a collection of over 1,500 pieces of contemporary art, ranging from sculpture to photography to painting to works on paper to installation, performance, film, all of it. Um, and it definitely started out kind of the way Sarah was saying, where it was just, you know, what they were drawn to at the time. Um, but slowly, you know, you do more research, you learn more about the artists, you spend time with the artists, and you really figure out what what speaks to you. And going back to the other question, I always say it's easy to love a piece that you bought 10 years ago that's retained its value. It's not so easy when it's worth nothing. So you really have to love the piece. You know, at the end of the day, you do. You have to love the work because there's a good chance that half the things you buy right now may not be valued at that at some point. And that's OK if, if you, you love it. it. So is there, an, is there an animating principle behind the Marciano collection now, or? The collection is very eclectic. Um, and working with two brothers, you know, they have their own personal tastes. Um, there is some overlapping of, of uh, what they're interested in. Um, but we kind of have in the collection, we have all these sort of mini collections under the umbrella of the collection. So we're always trying to make sure with new work, you know, one thing is, if it's a new artist that we're introducing to the collection, is this someone that we see ourselves going deep with and supporting you know, down, for many years down the road? Um, so that's something that we think about. Um, sorry, I just lost my train of thought. Um, but basically, I mean, it's, it's really, you know, it, it's, they, we, we, we try to find pieces that fit under these certain conceptual categories. So you know, it's always about content. But again, at the end of the day, 
it's also about that initial reaction if it's beautiful. I mean, they love beautiful things. They love things that make them feel good. And uh, so there's almost this sort of um, recurring visual aesthetic throughout the collection, despite the various conceptual things going on. There's sort of this like elegance to the collection. So um, it may not be immediately recognizable, but for me, I, I see it. What are some of the works you're most excited about for the opening? Um, I don't know if I can talk about that. Okay. <laughs> we'll ask you after. Okay. Right. <laughs> and Tao, I had the same question for you at CAA with your work on curating the collection there. What's your viewpoint or strategy, or how do you approach it? Um, is this on? Um, it started maybe 20 years ago um, when the new leadership took over CAA. We had to build a new collection because the former leadership took everything with him. Um, so when we sought out to build a new collection, we wanted to be very specific in our mission. And at the time, we recognized uh, a few key things. Um, we recognized that, you know, unlike New York and all of these other um, art hubs, um, we had a great density of art schools, um, CalArts, Otis, UCLA. And not only that, but there were a lot of artists giving back to the community and teaching at art schools. Because, you know, back then, on the East, if you were East Coast and you were, you were an artist and you were teaching, you were considered a failure. But on the West Coast, that mentality was completely different. So you had, you know, John Baldessari, Barbara Kruger, um, Charlie Ray, um, all of these great artists that were teaching, Chris Burden, Mike, um, Kelly. Mike Kelly, so, so many great artists um, that were also teaching at all of these schools. And so what we recognized were these two important uh, components or elements that, um, that really defined uh, the city, which was arts education in Southern California and art production in Southern California. And we sought out, okay, we're going to build a Southern California collection, and we're going to acquire works from Southern California, Southern California artists that produce work here, but also teach here or were educated here. So those were the pillars um, of our uh, philosophy in, in, in acquiring works. So 20 years, we've been just acquiring uh, works that fit within that construct. So obviously, we have the Cool School group, which includes, of course, Ruscha, Baldessari, Ed Moses, and then we have the mid-career, Catherine Opie, Mark Bradford, though it's kind of weird to call him mid-career. Uh, and then also when I came on board, um, I recognized that there were a lot of emerging voices that were missing in the collection, and I felt that it was really important to go back and capture those voices uh, that we didn't have in the collection. So, you know, when I came on board, you know, it's, it was acquiring Amanda Ross Ho and, and Rye Rocklin and Waleed Beshti and all of those artists. So it's very California specific. That's great. And going forward, do you have a... It's still California specific. <laughs> and right now, every, every artist you can imagine is moving here and producing work here and teaching here. <laughs> Um, so it's really, really exciting that, you know, we recognized this so early on, two decades ago. And so now everybody's paying attention to Southern California. We've been there for 20 years. I think one thing that's also interesting that you do, Val, is that you also work with artists in a different way, in that you're operating with artists. There's a collection, but then you're also operating as an agent for artists as well. Or I, I don't know. I don't know if I have a vocabulary. Yeah, vocabulary. yeah. I mean, I think um, you know, we're we are at a, at a moment where um, there are so many opportunities and platforms to express ideas, and we are very interested in working with artists that look to these other platforms to communicate their ideas outside of you know creating work and showing it in a space. So those are the things that we're interested in when we work with artists. But you know we're very um, um, we're very collaborative with all the galleries because they serve a very important role uh, in nurturing the artists. So you know 
um, where we can amplify, where we can enable, that's where we come in. Do you ever see the role of some place like CAA ever leading to an object or something that could As in making objects? Yeah, making object or sale of object or something that might no, be moved out? No, that's not something we're interested in. Just because it's a model that is not, it doesn't really align with an agency model because we deal in a business of scale. When you deal with galleries, it's not about scale. And it's equally important, but we're in the business of scale. And it's, I think it's too hard. The model doesn't make sense. Interesting. And then my next question was for Lily. Now, Lily, do you collect objects? Objects? Like paintings, photography, sculpture. Yeah. Um... <coughs> I do. I, uh, I would say that most of my collection has come through either artists that I'm friends with or have worked with through creative time or other non-for-profit projects or entities that I've been involved with. So I wouldn't say that I am a collector in the traditional sense. Um, I have collected pieces through projects that I'm passionate about. Um, but. Yeah, I don't have a curatorial mission for my own collection yet. <laughs> Could you talk a little bit about some of the things you've done with Creative Time and then Bombay Beach? Sure, sure. Yeah, well, I, I mean, I don't know if I've done anything with Creative Time. But for those of you that don't know, Creative Time is a non-for-profit in New York that creates large-scale, um, interactive, public artwork with contemporary artists and it and many of the projects that they they produce have a social practice framework around them so uh, we did the incredible piece with Kara Walker at the Domino Sugar Factory in New York which was amazing and it's a really you know seminal work for her but also a really interesting inquiry into you know the role of slavery in our country's history and um, in that particular community. So projects like that I find really inspiring and amazing. The Bombay Beach Biennale is um, it's a project that two friends and I started uh, in 2016 and it came, it's, it happens on the Salton Sea in this little trailer park town called Bombay Beach and um, it really, it came sort of from the inspiration of what Creative Time does. It, it's a town that a lot of artists and creatives go to uh, for inspiration and to sort of use as a character in their work. But we were noticing that nobody who was going there to make work was leaving anything behind for the community or was even really interacting with them. And so we were, we thought it'd be more interesting to invite artists to come and form a relationship with a town and then create work that would be left there so that um, it could either be a, you know, a, re a source of revenue for the town or just be something that they could enjoy that was really to elevate their experience of where they lived. Um, it's, you know, it's the poorest per capita county in the state and so we, didn't, we felt like they were being preyed upon and so to create a an art experience that was as much for them as for the people who came through was really important. And how many people Did came through this year? Answer your question. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> um, how many people came through? Came through. Uh, well, it was free to the public; like anybody could come through. So we don't actually have a number, but it was in the upper, you know, probably like around 800 people, wow. which was amazing. And there's 200 people that live in the town and. They were very actively involved in the in the project, and they were happy with today with this year's iteration. Also, <laughs> they were. Yeah, we were. Really, it was it was very sweet. We um, we created a few spaces that are being left in the town. One was an opera house that uh, the artist James Orster built, and then created a a gallery of his own work inside of. And we had the San Francisco Ballet come down and do a performance in it, and. You know, this is, it's a trailer park town, of, and I don't think they've ever had anything like that there. And, and there were a lot of tears of joy after that performance, and so we're really proud of that. And the artist was really happy that he got to do that for the town. 
that was great. What was, was your experience like? I thought it was amazing. You know, the, it, it, <laughs> it was physically shocking to be there just because of the smell from the salt and yeah, sea. Intense. And the kind of post-apocalyptic feel of the entire experience. And it was hot and dusty. And, mm -hmm. But there were, the artist installations were incredible. I was really impressed, particularly with Jen Dyke's film that she made oh, out there. Yeah, and the amazing. house she did. And it was a spectacular installation done on what seemed like a limited budget in yeah. challenging circumstances yeah. and she really made it work and I think those are the art experiences that people love is when it feels very authentic, very site specific and just exciting and interesting. Yeah, we had no rules. I mean, that's a pretty rare thing to happen in the art world, I think. Um, so. And I, I mean, I wonder after the success, also, I know you're both engaged with uh, Desert X, which was also a very um, location, a very site-specific, Instagram-friendly art experience. <laughs> um, and I'm just curious if that type of artist interaction is supplanting the traditional buy a photo, put it on the wall situation. The, or traditional, what our, our parents form of collection. Yeah, they're going beyond the object. If the object isn't enough anymore, they want a relationship with the artist, they want an experience. And I think that's why something like Doug Aiken's Mirror House was so successful, not just because it was Instagram friendly, but because it was this completely immersive experience and you had to seek it out you had to make an effort to go and do it the pilgrimage is definitely part yeah of it's part of it yeah like Martha yes yeah. it's yeah and I think that collectors who you know they have all their beautiful objects the next level for them is having these experiences and I think that's going to be the next sort of wave of collecting is experiences um, and things exactly like what you did, um, or like Christo, something like that, um, or the public art, things like yeah, that. Yeah, the 14th Street project that Simon Birch has going on right now is amazing, and it's in downtown LA, and I've never seen anything like it, so. They're popping up all over the place. Sarah, as a gallerist, how do you think, how do you bring, how does your model, the traditional, the traditional model, where do they come together? I mean, in terms of like, to, you know, in, in terms of interacting with doing things sort of more, uh, sort of outside the box, quite literally. Yeah. Um, you know, I, 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 truly, I mean, we do things just in terms of supporting doing commissions with artists, and you know, I mean, that for me in particular, sort of doing. Um, I've worked on uh, quite a few projects, like with, with Jenny Holzer, who's one. We did a big project in Ibiza, and we're about to work on something in Mexico City. And I, I've done quite a few um, commissions with her, and then I'm doing something with Bob Irwin um, in the south of France. And so I think, it, you know, I think more people are sort of thinking about bringing the art into their collections, but in a different way. Um, and like you said, and it's all about these relationships and becoming close with the artist, and then sort of, it, and it's a collaboration, really, between the person who's, you know, hosting this object. Um, and um, and uh, and the artists themselves, um, and that, that those are the experiences I think that artists even truly uh, enjoy the most as well. I mean, and then you know, I mean, the way that we put things out in the world are by you know museum shows, you know, doing exhibitions in, in different places. So I mean, that that's our um, that's our relationship with the outside world, and, you know, and stuff. And the fact that we also are a public space, you know, so people do come and see what we're doing all the time. So you know. So right now we're across from LACMA and because of all the, con you know, the construction, like that is a pilgrimage. So, um, but uh, you know, I think the, the, the public aspect for me in particular, as opposed to being in a museum, that, that's an important one that's always for me. I think, I think it really enhances the artist more when it competes with any kind of uh, gallery or so or yeah. commerciality to it. It's just where we see art as moving. You know where this is what people artists want to do it's what other artists want to see it's what collectors want to experience and it's just you know kind of pushing that envelope and it's a direction but it, it's not in, in conflict at all with like a gallery show or even what we do you know at auction like on the purely auction side you know we see something like house and north with our somerset location where they primarily use it for these kind of experience and it is far out you know outside of london and um it's 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 very uh well, 
attending. You know, it's something interesting that I think people really want to see and do, and it gives them another aspect in which to understand and view the artist. So I think it's just very exciting. For and sorry. No, I was just saying it's a very interesting model because if you look at Hauser and Worth, here they are at a gallery, but I almost see them as a hospitality brand um, because you know they own restaurants, they own hotels, they own chickens. They own, they own every component of the experiential value chain. So, you know, so it's really interesting to watch that dynamic and how they've evolved from a gallery to a hospitality brand. And I keep saying, you're a hospitality brand, which is great. But again, it's like, again, it's really, it's a really interesting time to see all of these different uh, institutions, galleries, really expend, experimenting with models and ideas. Um, how would someone who wants to get engaged with artists kind of enter this realm where of experiences or? I, I think you just start going to shows. Yeah, I mean, that's you it. Go see, no, you just I think that get, get on in the car, go to all the galleries, see all the shows, you, see what you like. Yeah. Um, and getting involved with institutions, I really think Join that. Join the museum you group. You don't yeah, just sort of drop yourself group. into that world. I mean, I mean, it's not. I mean, it, it is. It's a privilege, but I don't mean it as like a one percenter privilege. I mean, it's sort of like you know, you have to educate, educate yourself, be around, start going to galleries. I mean, and I was saying, I, I used to work for Larry Gagosian, and you know, people are like, how do you start collecting? He's like, start buying. Just start buying. Like, I mean, it could be ten dollars. It doesn't matter. But like, you got to like start getting started. And I, I even artists I know, they're like. Oh, I really want to get started, whatever. And I'm like, well, have you been to these galleries? They're like, no. I'm like, well, then how do you expect, or artists who want me to look at their work and things like that, you know, and and, and, and they haven't been to the gallery before. You have, to, be part of you have to get involved with looking at things and educate yourself and, you know, and then specify because, like, it's a big world out there. I, I mean, there are six different art worlds. And I, I mean, I only know <laughs> one of them, you know, and there's, it's like, you can't possibly understand. It's so vast. Um, and so you have to kind of do the educating and then decide what it is that you like and what you want to be part of it. And there has to be a kind of reciprocal experience. It is a small community, though, in the end of the day. Art, but I think that there's a bigger art world out there, you know, and, and it can be, um, I mean, we're the ones that deal with the museums and, and the foundations, very much this, this one, but you know, it's like, I, but I think that there, there are other people making art and selling art and, and showing art in places you know, in warehouses that we're not even familiar with. And like, it's all good. Yeah. You know, I mean, you, have, you, you just have to get, you know, get there. And get in there. And start talking to people. And you can even mark, it, you'd be surprised how remarkably giving people are with their knowledge and information. People want to talk want about to art. Talk about they want to talk about their practice. They always want to talk about their kids. They want to talk about their art. And this is what they're passionate about. Yeah. So just listen, you know, and be there. And again, I can't stress the institution of the gallery. I mean, the ones here are just like just beyond. We are so incredibly lucky to be living in this city. You know, they, you know, a museum group will, you know, sometimes do like a tour of studios, and they'll go to that, that type of studio. It's like, oh, it's interesting. It's like that for a reason, and that can really give those kind of, you know, filter a little bit, and also see things through a different uh, lens. Now, you started. <coughs> you began a group, correct? Or at the director, the director of South Park, yeah, yes. we did, which was, it's still a fantastic group and we're still part of it. And, um, you know, James <laughs> on it. <laughs> yeah. So the director's council at MOCA is, um, you know, it's, it's a little bit more of a commitment a year, but we're very specific about what we want to do. And we take the, the, the money that we raise from the dues and we do studio visits throughout the year. And from those studio visits, we get offered certain pieces uh, from these artists, and then we vote on it at the end of the year. And it's a fantastic way to meet collectors and other people who are in the art world and interested, um, and to see the artists and to learn about the art and then and be part of that community. You know, it, it, things like that are just a fantastic way to kind of uh, get your feet wet and, and learn. You know. So. Yeah. Also, we also have incredible. Um, master's programs here in California, in Southern California. I go to open studios for those. It's a great way to start getting to know artists that are coming through LA. Yeah, some of them will be, the, they yeah. are the next generation. Yeah. I mean, yeah, it's, 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 it's overwhelming there. how much there is, but I think, yeah. like, I, 
not so much so that you can't start, you can start somewhere and you can sort of like get through the wormhole and figure it out. I think we've covered a lot of ground here today. Um, and my question, do you guys have any questions for one another? I was wondering if anyone on the panel had. It's so nice to we be talk all to each other all the time. This is like, it's so nice to have a conversation with you. I know, I was actually yeah. attending. That's an amazing group of people. Um, so I might open up questions from the floor then, if there are any for our panelists. They're getting bigger spaces. Yeah. Well, that was you always think? the draw of LA, what? though, is that you could get such a large studio space as an artist. Like, so coming from New York, where you have these tiny thousand square foot studios, you could come out here and get like a 10,000, 20,000 square foot studio for the same price or even less. And but people are priced out of Frogtown now. Yeah, yeah it, it keeps going expensive. farther east, but. I don't think it's, it has to do with the gentrification of downtown. I think that people are, uh, the artists kind of gravitate towards it. You see clusters of studios, wow. you know, like, so they want to stay within a certain group of creativity and amongst each other. The conversation is really what's important and cheaper space. Mm -hmm. um, but, you know, I think downtown has flourished so much. It's still a long haul to get there. <laughs> but, you know, there's so much to see once you're down there that it's really fantastic, you know. Um, you have to remember also the artists have to pay their own rent mm -hmm. or mortgage and then they also have to pay for their studio and sometimes they'll have both in one which is great but not everyone can do that so these artists have two rents to pay and so yeah. I think they're going further out just because it's more financially doable. Yeah. I actually had a question. Yeah, I, um, I've been hearing from a lot of artists when they have collectors come directly to them and not go through the gallery. They're asking for these huge discounts. And I, I was, yeah, like, what? <laughs> how do you guys deal with, with people? It, it seems like people feel really entitled to get yeah, these who? discounts, <laughs> you know? And I, it just seems like a very well, ethical gray area. You know, I kind of, I, I, I'm sort of two-minded. I mean, there are, there are older artists who've been around, done this for a long time, and they have certain relationships with people that go way beyond even the gallery relationships they have. And there are people that come in the studio and they do their thing, and you know what? God bless them, it's fine. Um, I think, in a weird way, it's also the responsibility of the collector to sort of respect that relationship, especially you know now, and to kind of um, make sure that things go through the gallery. And then most artists, I would say, will say, they don't want to deal with those kinds of things. That's not their business. I mean, that's what, they, that's what like, the galleries are for, is their you know, sort of blockage. Um, uh, you know, or or just to manage that side of things. Like that, an artist has enough to think about in their creativity; they don't want to have to work think about the art business. But um, but discounts are a big part of of what we do. And 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 some of the collectors, I mean, someone like uh, Morris Marciano and the Marciano brothers. It's like you know, I mean, they have made such a deep commitment to so many artists that I've worked with. I mean, it's like, of course. And then building a foundation in probably one of the coolest buildings in town, down the street from my gallery. It's like, what? You know, I mean, there are people, it's sort of, it's... it's Historically, it's, institutions always would get really yeah. huge discounts. And so so if, if you're MoMA or MoCA or LACMA and you want to buy a piece and you go through the gallery, you'll typically you get, get a very, course. because you I'm, want the piece in the institution. Yeah. And you want, or you want it in a certain collector's home because it really shows like, uh, where the artist is going and kind of, you know. Or they're just repeat clients yeah. and people who have really helped support you and supported that artist and like it, it, it you want to, you know, extend that generosity. Um, but, you know, now it's, it, it's sort of commonplace and, and you know, I'd like, it's almost like you, you, you come to expect it. So I, I, it's, sometimes you do, sometimes you don't. But, you know, I mean, the world's in a tricky place right now. So, uh, you know, sometimes you want to admit you, you know, you want to make a deal, but you're willing say, to play ball. So. Most artists, they, if they find themselves in that situation, they should really deflect to their gallery. Well, well I, I would never advise anyone to do that. Yeah. What's that? It was all the I gallery. Yeah. yeah. No, no, no. I mean, no. It, it's kind. Of, I, um, I, I, I almost always give a uh, give a discount. I think it's just, it's sort of, you know, what they call the art world. You know, it's a gentleman's business, which is slightly hilarious. But <laughs> I, but I think you know. So you just kind of, yeah, on so many levels. But I think um, I'm, I'm used to, I, you know, 
people will give it. You know, I, I'm, I, I will always, uh, you know, expect to have to give it. But sometimes, I mean, you and just a lot can't. of collectors don't even know to ask. I mean, all of you have the right they to do ask any for 10%. Order. No, you, I mean, I, people just don't know that you yeah. can ask for it. And yeah. you, and you can, can ask for 10%, for that's standard. That no. I mean, sometimes yeah. I, I just offer it because sometimes. I know that, like, I've already prepared for it. And I think, you know, it's maybe also a new collector who you want to sort of make this, you know. Well, it can be short-sighted, too, because the, the people who insist on discounts might be less attractive clients going forward if you're never rather aggressive with that. Yeah, you never know. Well, and also if the gallery finds out that you're going directly to the artist, they're going to blacklist you and not sell you any of their other right, right. artist's work. Yeah, so it's just not the smartest thing. I don't find that happens that, that often. I really don't. So, yeah. At least I don't know about it. <laughs> Ed? made it grow so much because now instead of having to like go physically to see the shows I can see all the shows in New York off you know the internet most galleries will post their like you know install shots and these sorts of things so it's just like the amount of information out there is so vast and um, you can really learn and be so educated about you know where work is coming from where trends are kind of hitting and, and these sorts of things and it's just made um, a more savvy collector and it's made people be more responsible in some ways. Yeah, I mean, I also work with Sterling Ruby, who um, designs with Raph Simmons and just did the entire Calvin Klein um, showroom and everything like that. So, I mean, that's a very obvious connection. Um, but I think there are a lot of people, you know, sort of artists designing sneakers and, you know, sort of Isn't objects. he working with uh, Louis Vuitton now? Yeah, I mean, yeah, so like, yeah. and that is, you like know, Murakami and then like did the back. Pharrell and Murakami and George yeah. Kondo and Kanye and, you know, I mean, it's like there, there's so much sort of fashion artist collaborations and I think that's, just, and frankly, I, and, I, and I think it's 110% great. You know, I mean, if you're a contemporary artist, that is part of your contemporary understanding. Um, and so, I mean, if it's if it's done well, I um, I think that those crossovers it's a natural sort of extension. And so you know, it just is more is more. Yeah. But also with I've online sales, like we we've seen a massive increase. Yeah. Our our online sales have have more than quadrupled in a year. Wow. Yeah. Isn't that insane? So we had to develop our own. So a long story but with Christie's.com when you do an online sale it's actually our platform so we had to develop it ourselves and put a lot of money into it and that's why it's not the fanciest <laughs> but it, it really it works yeah. and um, just just by nature of you know uh, people being able to see things online not having to go to the gallery space not having to do these things you'd be amazed and then the, and like we thought at some point you know people would only buy up to a certain amount online but no, people are buying up to you know quarter million dollars online without seeing it. Like they would do it at, at an auction, yeah. which is what. Oh, it's really because interesting. they because they know that there's another bidder that's not like. No, in, there's in, it's in not an auction. Time. I mean, like a private sale. Interesting. Yeah. <laughs> I need a platform. Yeah. We can partner. Um, but no, we've seen a huge jump in our online sales. It's still only about like three percent of our business. You know, but I think our big numbers are people always prefer a live auction. But in terms of actual growth, it's a huge, huge growth area for us. Yeah. I deal a lot with the artsy and palette folks, and it's obviously it's all about online sales. So in the last year, their online sales have quadrupled as well. Uh, just because, again, if you look at this next generation of consumers, they're digital natives. They consume content only digitally. They don't walk into galleries, and that's why when you talk about experiences, that's why they're important, because this community wants to share that moment. And so all of these different platforms that enable sharing, that's part of the future. And I think, you know, and it's always fascinating to see how sort of these old structures evolve to adapt to this new way of consuming content. I think also Instagram has really changed the the viewing experience for the viewer. Um, I know I do it. You know, when I go to a gallery, sometimes the first thing I think is, 
which one am I going to post? Or what pic what, which picture, which could, what's going to be the best picture? <coughs> you know, and so a lot of times I've found myself leaving my phone in my car so that I don't do that. Yeah. And I actually am looking at the actual painting and processing it. And then if I want to take a picture, I go back and get my phone or I turn it off or something. But it's really distracting. And I find it to be a problem. And also, I mean, you go to the Broad and people are jumping in front of yeah. the coons. And it's a selfie <laughs> epidemic. So it's, and that's fine. People are excited about it and that's great. But it's really changed um, the atmosphere in galleries and museums, I think. And sometimes it's offensive, I have to say. Especially in an art fair when it's something very delicate. Yeah. <laughs> and like, oh, no. <laughs> Buy it. I think it makes a curator more powerful. I think we're at a time where curation is so important. Um, just because there's so much information out there, and there's so much crap information. So, so we need editors, we need curators to really edit this and also process it and put it in a context because everything moves so quickly. We don't have time to think anymore. We have no time to process. And so the role of the curator is even much more valuable uh, in the future. I would, I would be very careful um, uh, from, I, I know there's probably a ton of art sites that are selling art, um, obviously like a Christie's or a Sotheby's or, you know, kind of, or these, these sites um, have a lot of, we have a lot of fiduciary duty to our consignors, so we are very specific about what we put up there, we vet it, you know, condition reports, but I can't vouch for all the sites that do that, you know, so you really want to make sure about authenticity for work. You want to make sure about condition, even though it's like we'll always have a condition report. You want to make sure you read through it, visit the site unseen, um, and get the high res images. We'll certainly send those out, you know, and, you know, yeah. Just you can also always that. ask someone to send you a video of the artwork, yeah. too. That sometimes helps. We'll do that as well. Like if I can't go to the gallery or <laughs> I've see done, it. I've sold off FaceTime. Yeah. Yeah. Because sometimes so even helps. for the live auctions, if people can't make it to New York for the view or they can't make it to LA or the piece isn't here, I'll, I'll FaceTime it, you know, and it, it gives an idea of scale. Because that's one thing you miss in a JPEG. Like you can get real detail, you can see a lot of things, but standing in front of a piece, and if it's, you know, like a JPEG, if it's this big, it looks the same, or if it's, you know, six feet by, you know, 10 feet, it looks the same. So it's that feeling of standing in front of the piece that sometimes you miss um, when you don't actually see it in person. But it does help to see it, you know, in live, you know, time with somebody standing in front of it for scale. And you can ask for all those things. every other aspect of the world right now, I really can't <laughs> help you with that. You might not be alive. <laughs> yeah, I mean, yeah, honestly, it's, I mean, I, 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 yeah, I I'm not I'm like apocalyptic, I'm hopeful. Um, you know, I have kids, but um, I don't know. I mean, here's the one thing that takes out, you know, it's sometimes, you know, when there is this upheaval and, you know, and when the world is crazy and things are going mad, you know, artwork gets better. There's something to react against, and yeah. so you know. I mean, and that—that's sort of what you look towards. You know, to be sort of inspiring, and people are, you know, uh, that's the platform through which a lot, of, a lot of people have really, really important, interesting things to say. And if, if hopefully, we'll, we'll, we'll still be able to say them. I wanted to say that I think that the become so. So Mike is such a genius, but um, 
his work is it can be difficult for some. It's not a flat painting, you know. It's not the not every. Easy. It's not easy no. work. It's really conceptual. It's really in his own head, and um, sometimes can be very large and, yeah. and onerous in scale to install. <laughs> but. But he certainly does how we all are we all do it quite well. I, I mean, it he's certainly a does cultural well. sponge, but the way that it was put out in the world is can be yeah. can be tricky. But you know, I mean, what's beautiful about Mike? I mean, there were a lot of things, um, but he was a teacher, and um, you know, his his work lives on. I mean, there are a lot of people, um, a lot of like colleagues, you know, and um, and a lot of people who he taught that are. You know, sort of little tidbits of, of his world can be seen in in a lot of a, most a lot of you know sort of Southern California artists right now. Sterling Ruby. Yeah, sure. yeah. I mean, Sterling was his, his yeah. They, uh, Dave Muller. I mean, like even somebody sort of like Kari Upson. You know, I mean, I think who there he opened the door in a way to a lot of the kind of uh, the sort of the hybrid of sort of high and low culture and fusing the two and the kind of sort of like like a punk rock spirit. Um, kind of like there's a little bit of Detroit Detroit in there, and a little bit of yeah, California, um, and I think I mean you, you you can't really even define like his his impact on California in 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 so many words. And I mean in the market, I don't know. It was never. It's been sort of hard for me to even like sort of talk about the market with Mike because that was I mean that it was sort of a double edged sword. He sort of couldn't couldn't care less about it and cared all about it. Um, so. But it's interesting when artists pass, you would expect their market to go up because you know they're not producing any more work. But it doesn't always happen like that. Sometimes it takes time for that to happen. Yeah. It'll take a year or two. Like I remember when Lewitt died. Like, yeah. you know, it was normal. And then like, and then all these wall drawings started coming up because yeah. you know there are no more now. Well, and so also, like, there isn't a lot of work available. Like when they die, you know what I mean. Like yeah. in their career, when yeah. like, his work yeah. sold. So I mean, there were there were some more recent work and things like that. It's not like, you know, they're like six hundred print songs that one day we might hear. Right. You know what I mean? It's a, like a lot of started. It's finite. You know, so uh, I, you know, we'll see how much the market goes. I mean, it, it does eventually, but you know, I don't, I don't know. Who to say? If you're here in five years, we'll let you know. <laughs> well, thank you so much for participating. I really appreciate it. Can I just add one quick thing before we wrap up in terms of the next five years, and I don't want to get political, but you know, the NEA is de being defunded, federal state funding is not around for the arts anymore, so everybody can do their part to be supportive to the art world in that way and yeah, to amen. artists. That's so key. So private funding of the arts in every sense is going to be so important. So important. Yeah, that's my little wrap up. Thank you. <laughs>